Good evening or good afternoon. Good whatever time of day it is, wherever you are, welcome. My name is Sam Ankerson. I'm the director of the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum and very glad you joined us for this program, Spooky Mollusks and Other Evils of the Deep, a Halloween special with our own Jose Leal. I've been looking forward to this program since Jose uh, suggested it early in the summer. Now, having been here for a few months and learning more about mollusks all the time, an incredible group of animals, depending on who you're talking to, more than 50,000 species, more than 80,000 species, all shapes and sizes all over the world. But one thing I've learned, especially in being here at the museum and in close proximity to a lot of living mollusks, is that they do just horrible things to each other. They have infinite array of creative ways to dismember each other and uh, do all kinds of things, eat their kids, who knows what. And it's, it's, it's pretty mind boggling. And, and Jose will get into some of that and a lot more of the dark and fascinating attributes of mollusks as we head towards Halloween. So I know you're gonna enjoy this program and thank you for, uh, for, for being with us. This is the last in our series of online lectures in 2021. It's the 11th in the series and all are posted, uh, all were recorded and are posted on the museum's website, shellmuseum.org. So you can go there anytime and see previous lectures and after, after today, this lecture will be up there too. Great range of topics and speakers, including two previous talks of Jose's, a March 25th presentation on ocean acidification and its effects on mollusks. And then on June 29th, he did a talk on new photographs of shells in the museum's collection. So that's up there with all of the others. It has been a treat to produce and present this online lecture series. Great to be able to reach people all over the country, all over the world through the low points of, of COVID and through the ebbs and flows of seasonality in the Sanibel area. And I uh, hope those of you who may have uh, watched previous programs have, have enjoyed it. A number of staff here at the museum have worked very hard on it, including Stephanie Medell, our marketing director, senior marine biologist, Rebecca Mensch, and uh, big thanks to them and an extra special thanks to all of our speakers and especially to Jose who supported this idea from the beginning, had great ideas for speakers and is now contributing his, his third talk to the series. So thank you, thank you, Jose. In early November, we will be announcing the museum's new exhibitions for the coming season and also our January through April 2022 speaker series, which we're very excited about, some great people coming. We're planning to do the speaker series in person, both at the museum and also at the community house here in Sanibel. So stay tuned for that. We expect the next spring and summer with our lectures, we may return to an online format to, to be able to keep in touch with people as they disperse, but uh, we'll see. Um, so stay tuned for, for announcements on the programming in a couple of weeks. I wanna put in a quick plug for, some, for a new adult education program, which is happening this fall, uh, classes uh, starting in late October. These are classes taught by Jose or Becca Mensch. They include shell morphology, which is gonna be, be on October 28th. Shell photography taught by Jose on November 11th. What's that shell? A shell identification class on November 16th. And then in early December, Jose and Becca will co-teach a class understanding and curating your shell collection. There's more information on all of that and including registration information at uh, the museum's website. This is the webinar format and we love all questions and welcome all questions. Uh, to ask your questions, you'll need to type them in though. The chat button along the bottom of your screen, if you move your cursor along the bottom, you'll see it. Uh, type in your questions at any time and I'll monitor those. And after, after Jose's presentation, we'll come back 
and do Q and A with the questions that have been sent in. So please feel free to do so. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jose H. Leal, museum director, science director, curator, malacologist, conchologist, author, photographer, surfer, speaker <laughs> of three languages, reader of another four, and the soul of the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum. Welcome, Jose. Hope you all enjoy the talk, and we'll see you on the other side for questions. Thanks. Thank you so much. Can you all um, see the screen and hear me well? Um, I want to uh, welcome everyone, and I want to thank Sam for his very kind words and for, um, you know, um, you know, giving the honor of closing the, this very successful lecture series. So being the Shell Museum and you all being the audience of the Shell Museum, I know that you all like shells to some extent and many of you I know, know a lot about mollusks already after, you know, being uh, the audience of the lecture series and the things that we put out from the museum. But, uh, and you also know that Halloween is the time of year when we deal with black cats, witches, um, all kinds of creepy things. Um, what you may not know is that our shell makers, the mollusks, uh, can be included in that. As Sam started mentioning, uh, there's a lot of bizarre and, and uh, interesting and, and very diverse things that mollusks can do for a living or for dying or for killing. Um, so, uh, let me go through that and I hope you have fun. And as, as Sam mentioned, you know, leave your questions, keep, keep your questions coming and I will address them at the end. So the first thing I wanna show you, and it's actually a segue from the image that's already in here. And that's, um, that's our vampire squid. Um, being Halloween, um, it's very appropriate that we deal with vamp vampires and the name of the squid is called, it's a, it's a vampire squid, Vampiro, Vampirotutis infernalis. The squid, the vampire squid from hell, if you translate the scientific name of the species. But the name of the species is not uh, given to the species because it sucks blood as, uh, you know, vamp vampires and vampire ba bats do. It's more because of the way they look like. They look actually look like, if you look carefully, uh, the, there is a, uh, the foot or the mantle of the, the squid here has a bunch of, um, you know, very prominent um, spike-like structures. And the, 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 the webbing there actually looks very much like, you know, I was thinking, you remember the Cape of Count Dracula? That's what it looks like to me. And I think that's what it looked like to uh, the people who first named this species back, I believe in the 1950s. It's a deep water species. As I said, it doesn't feed on blood. It doesn't suck blood. There'll be other animals that do that coming soon. Um, the uh, vamp vampire squid feeds on organic detritus, um, things that, leave, that uh, it, they find in the deep sea and the mouth is around here. Um, and I also want to, uh, let you know that I was just reading about it before I started. Vampire squids are not squids. They look like octopuses, but they are not octopuses. They belong to their own very special group within the cephalopods. So uh, that's our first uh, example of a scary, spooky um, Halloween mollusk. Um, well, some of you may know what a radula is. And to me, um, the spirit of Halloween and horrible things that mollusks do is very well embodied by the molluscan radula. The radula is a, a series of, um, you know, a, pretty much like a, a, a tongue of teeth that most um, snails and cephalopods uh, use to get their food. And they work in many, many different, different ways. And it will be seen quite a few different radula here today. This is a picture of a Argentinian uh, murex um, that's pretty spectacular. And uh, one of my Argentinian colleagues took this image under a scanning electron microscope. 
and the picture itself, it, you know, give, give him, gives me the creeps. It's, uh, it's kind of scary. Evidently, this is small. It looks big here, but it's a, uh, it's a very thin line that uh, those snails use to drill onto other shells. Once they drill onto, um, let's say, a clam shell, they will inject a, a, a series of venoms that will cause that <clears throat> the prey to relax, uh, open, and they then proceed to eat it. So let me show you a couple more. Uh, this actually is another example of a, um, a snail, just to give you an idea um, how a radula works. This is a, uh, right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, a little red dot, that's the mouth region here. Uh, the radula is this uh, kind of a scale, uh, a series of teeth there. Uh, the blue here is the food and the movements back and forth ca cause the radula to move food into the esophagus, into the digestive section of, of that snail. That's how the radula works. Evidently, as I said, there are many different kinds of radula and I selected a few for you here that um, look pretty, pretty horrible when you think of it, when I actually took these pictures in uh, many, many years ago of a, uh, a species of shallow water snail from Brazil called the Zelinda volute and named by a colleague of ours, um, a malacologist, uh, Dr. Ed Petuk. Well, well, to me, when I first saw that, when I took this picture, the first thing that came to mind was um, a chainsaw and being Halloween, that evokes the idea of the, that movie, the, the Chainsaw Massacre. Um, the radula here actually works as, as a chainsaw, moving back and forth to cut pieces of the animal they are eating. Um, and here is a, the actual thing, the chainsaw. Um, I will save you, I'll move fast forward so we don't have to keep looking at that horrible character there. Um, uh, very horrifying. Um, show you a picture of the shell. It's actually a very elegant little shell about an inch and a half long, uh, not common at all. It comes from, it lives in a very, very narrow of the Eastern Brazilian coast, south of the equator. This is a shell from the museum collection, collection here. Um, another radula that also uh, you know, brings um, images, brings, ev evokes images of horror to me he may do that to you too. And that's a cold water volute, a uh, odontosimbilla. It's a, um, something you don't have here. It comes from, this species comes also from Argentina and Southern Brazil. Um, and look at those teeth. They're very elegant, very scary though. In side view, this is the same um, a top view and a side view. Um, those um, supposedly they feed on other mollusks and some marine invertebrates. Um, now imagine um, if you're uh, about the same size as that predator, um, you probably don't want to have to deal with that. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive, probably pretty horrible uh, having to confront that. Um, so uh, I want to wish you at this point a happy Rattler win, uh, which is uh, coming uh, in, a, in about a week or so, a little more than a week. Uh, so this is an image of that volute, that cold water volute. Um, and it, it grows to be quite large. I mean, about eight inches long. And you can see the animal, the head here, and the radula will be somewhere under the head uh, right there. Uh, that very radula, first time I saw it, I thought of um, Edward Scissorhands, who is not really a horrible character if you have seen the movie I did. Um, but the, just the shape um, of those teeth uh, remind me of those long, uh, long finger claws of Edward. Um, and then um, I thought a little more about it. And uh, just let, recently I found something else that kind of, I, kind of reminded me um, of, um, of that radula, which is the hands or the fingers of uh, the monster and the beach girls of 1965, uh, what type of a B, maybe a C or D movie. Um, anyway, uh, very monstrous. 
want to talk also a little bit about um, some deep sea snails that specialize in um, actually feeding on corpses. Um, I actually uh, wrote here grave robbers, and they actually they they do not dig into a grave because those bodies, those corpses they feed on, are the bodies are the corpses of deep of whales that uh, after dying fall onto the deep sea bottom to then be eaten by um, by um, deep sea snails. Those pieces here are the large ribs of um, carcasses or corpses of um, uh, whales that have died. Uh, in this case, it's a, um, a particular whale skeleton that was found to be living uh, at the bottom of uh, the, um, the Monterey Canyon out of um, central California in very deep water about uh, it's almost like 9,000 feet deep. What, what, what those animals feed on, those snails feed on, on the fatty tissues on the called lipids that are a part of the whale bones. So they specialize, they specialize on feeding that. So they are not opening a, a grave, but they're still eating, eating um, a dead animal. Another image here showing the, uh, those uh, bone eating snails, a uh, big, big whale bone, um, uh, more snails and a deep sea crab that also likes that environment, sea anemone. This is actually a little video that I don't know if I can play here. It doesn't, not much happen there. So it's not really a video at this point. Um, so a, uh, a whale bone devouring snails. Well, let's talk about the vampire snails. I talked about the vampire squid, which is not a squid, which is not an octopus, and it's not a vampire because it doesn't feed on blood. However, there are snails that actually love to, to feed on the blood, especially blood, blood of fishes. And they use a, a number of subterfuges. They, are, um, they don't kill the fish they feed on. They actually wait for that fish to uh, rest, to quote unquote sleep. And after they, uh, they are resting, the snail gets near them and, and uh, puts the proboscis near or at or on the, uh, the gill filaments, where then, whereby they you know, proceed to suck uh, on the blood um, of those fish. So the fish keep sleeping because not only they can, the snails not only suck the blood, but they put some little uh, numbing um, substance there to prevent the fish from feeling and, and running away. And uh, after um, the meal is ended, a snail goes away, the fish is still sleeping. Um, they wake up, it may be uh, next morning or it may be next afternoon, but they will wake up and keep on going as if nothing had happened. Um, so they are not really parasites, they just feed temporarily on the blood of, um, of fish, of uh, tropical fish in this case. This is a... a diagram of the, the front part of the digestive system of those fish with the mouth here at the end. There are also much smaller, oh, by the way, the, the vampire snails are, they range in size anywhere from one inch to about two and a half, three inches. Uh, much smaller snails uh, in the family of marginalas, they also do a similar, uh, you know, uh, trick. And, and in this case, it's not just one, it's actually a number of them. Um, uh, Giberula is the name of the, the, the genus of those um, marginalis, and they suck on um, the blood of tropical fish. Uh, again, here, this is a, the fin, uh, the pectoral fin of uh, parrot fish. And that's where they are <clears throat> doing the job there of um, being va little vampires collective vampires, if you will, uh, having a little feast. Um, also uh, in the realm of micromollusks, and those are 
those are pyrams, which are very, very small. Some of them um, a quarter of an inch or less. Um, they feed on the juices or the, the blood, the hemolymph, as we call in, in technically speaking, of, of bivalves, in this case, a uh, tropical oyster. So there's a number of them. Um, pyrams do not have a radula. You know, you've seen the radula before. Pyrams, instead, they have one single needle, uh, that, uh, like a stylet, that pierces the, the, um, the flesh of that oyster. And after doing that, then they pump the blood uh, of that liquid in for feeding, and they can attach themselves for life onto uh, oysters. So what do we have next? Um, we have parasites. Um, here um, we have a uh, eulimid, in this case, a melanellus species that we actually find here on Sanibel. Um, and this was actually a picture taken in, uh, in the Bahamas. And what they're, they're doing is they're attached for life to um, sea cucumbers. Um, they parasitize sea cucumbers and other, other relatives like uh, sea cucumbers are echinoderms like uh, sea stars, sea urchins and sand dollars. And, uh, and many of those different echinoderms are <clears throat> permanent hosts to um, uh, mel melanellas and other eulimid snails, which feed on again on the blood of uh, those guys. I want to talk about something that's really, really interesting. And, uh, and when you think of it, it's pretty spooky. Uh, this is a very, very large, the very high magnification um, of a, um, a freshwater clam larva that we call a glochidium. The plural is glochidia. And uh, what happens is that, and I'll show you an, a, a diagram next uh, showing the, the, the sequence of how this happens. But just I want to just to explore this image with you first. Um, this is like a little clam. The only difference is this is a little clam that has on each valve or on each half of the shell a very, very sturdy tooth. And what happens is now I'm going to move to the next slide and show you a, a series of uh, illustrations here. This is kind of complex. You don't have to read here. Just, I will explain each one. This is a female, um, a female clam on the right here on the bottom. And the female clam has a structure here on its mantle, on this edge of its flesh that resembles a fish. And it resembles a very specific species of fish. And that very specific species of fish will attract uh, a partner, um, and which then once it gets uh, the other real fish comes closer, the female releases uh, a quote unquote cloud of larvae into the mouth and the gills of that fish. Uh, so those larvae are, I've shown you before, they have those powerful teeth on each one on each side. Uh, once inside the gill or near the gill filaments of the fish, the little clam will clamp and will clamp pretty much like a, like a uh, staple. It will you know, kind of attach itself very strongly to the gill filaments. Uh, and here is an image of uh, the little guys, the little larvae. And here an image of a couple of, or maybe three, three gill filaments showing the little larvae attached to it. And time will pass, they will feed on the, on the blood that goes through the gill filaments. And after time passes, in some cases up to a couple of months, um, those little guys who have developed enough and they will fall to the bottom to begin again, to continue the life cycle now as juveniles or um, young of those freshwater clams. So we actually have a very cool video we show here in one of our exhibits in the museum that shows just that, that process. And again, just to refresh your memory, this is a scanning electron micrograph that's been colorized to show um, you know, the possible color of that, <clears throat> that larva. Uh, more corp corpse eaters. I mean, Halloween is coming close, so why not? Um, we have uh, locally here, I actually took this picture um, in nearby uh, Bunch Beach in Fort Myers, Florida, um, a uh, Bruce Nassa, 
And Bruce Nassa are scavengers, so they are not predators. They only feed on dead bodies. They can be the dead bodies of fish, shrimp, echinoderms, crabs. In this case, a horseshoe, a small horseshoe crab, most likely a moat, which is a, uh, as the horseshoe crabs grow, they live behind um, old shells and build new ones. Um, so this probably the remains of a, uh, of a little small uh, growth stage of a uh, horseshoe crab. The interesting thing about uh, Bruce Nass is they, they have very, very good um, um, smell, sense of smell, sense of chemical detection underwater, smell or taste is whatever you want to call it. Uh, they can detect the uh, substances produced when the body is decomposing and they can move really fast to begin feeding on that uh, corpse. So uh, those are local and they're really, really interesting to watch because they move really fast, they feed really fast. Um, same thing can be said of uh, the local uh, lettered olives, which are, they are basically, I don't wanna call them omnivores, but they are almost omnivores in that they can be predators, they can, they can feed on, on live clams, on other live mollusks, but they can also uh, feed on decomposing um, bodies. In this case, the decomposing body of a speckled swimming crab. A picture taken by our friend and colleague, Amy Tripp, a citizen scientist from uh, Marco Island and Cape Cod during the summer. Uh, great photographer, she catches those special moments uh, of sea life and doing the things they do best. And uh, I'm really grateful that we can use their, um, her images in our programs. Um, I wanna talk a little about um, bacteria eaters. You, in this case, a, a deep sea uh, mussel uh, that was named in 1994, uh, not too long ago. It's, yeah, I know it's not yesterday, but uh, for a species that's not, a, it's, it's a relatively recently named species. Um, it is actually a, a shell that it, in, it's in our deep sea mollusk exhibit here in the Great Hall. And uh, it's a part of a group of deep sea mussels that grow their own bacteria. They live in an environment that favors the growth of um, those uh, sulfur loving bacteria. And, um, and the way they do it is that uh, they don't have a mouth. They basically derive all their food from growing the bacteria inside between the gill filaments. And here the brown, brown collar um, represent uh, the gill filaments, the gills and the gill filaments. And if you take a cross section and run, uh, uh, very sophisticated uh, uh, things that you can do in a biological lab. In this case, it's called uh, uh, fl uh, fluorescence microscopy uh, that makes the bacteria glow in different colors when you use that technique. So you have two kinds of bacteria um, or, or um, symbionts, as we call them in this case, because they are helping each other. The mollusk provides the environment for the bacteria and the bacteria actually uh, provides the food um, to the mollusks. Uh, two kinds of bacteria, one seen in green fluorescence, the other one seen in red fluorescence. Um, many, many gastropods in uh, near uh, underwater um, volcanic um, places uh, that we call hydrothermal vents, they also carry um, their own uh, little gardens of bacterial food. Uh, this is a scaly foot gastropod named in 2015 by Chong Chang and his uh, collaborators. And it's a fantastic snail. I tried to get one here uh, for our uh, collection or exhibit and I never really could do that, but I still hope to get one one day. They are also, are also bacteria eaters. Um, but the special thing about them them is that they have an armor, the shell is armored with um, iron sulfide, which is a, a form of metal, um, iron, it's an iron oxide. The foot has those fantastic uh, um, scales that also contain metal. So uh, 
uh, you can think of that as a, almost as a Halloween costume, if you will, uh, um, worn by a uh, bacteria lover. It doesn't get any worse. Actually, it does get worse than that, and that, that's coming now. Um, some of you may uh, may know Edgar Allan Poe. I really liked some of his stories. Uh, some of them kind of too creepy for me, but uh, still, I think I've read all his short tales and and his horror uh, um, stories. Um, Edgar Allan Poe, as some of you may know, comes uh, hailed uh, from uh, Baltimore and uh, had a very large body of, of work. And one of his uh, stories is the Cask of Amontillado in which a character um, uh, had the habit of uh, luring um, quote unquote friends to his um, um, cellar um, to pretending that he was going to offer them good wine. And uh, in the process, he ended up um, entombing those people um, for life, enshrining them um, inside a wall. And that to me is one of, it's a really, really kind of creepy, probably more than you want to hear now. But there are models that, that go through a similar process. They can stay alive in, in, without moving in the same spot, buried inside different structures. And, uh, and the first one I want to show you is a, um, a muscle called a mahogany date muscle. And here is a piece of coral that I've had for many, many years. And, and that's the same piece of coral um, shown in cross section. And you can see here a number of uh, mollusks that actually live inside those hard, uh, it's almost like rock, the coral rock, the coral, the old coral colony. Um, the coral colony grows from uh, here on out grows outward. And here is a, a detail showing, you know, a diagram showing a little piece of the coral colony and a larva of a date mussel, a mahogany date mussel that just settled. The larva lives in open water and at some point they, it comes the moment when they need to begin living attached to something. So this is that, that moment when the larva just settled and begins it, the process of uh, boring into the coral colony. Uh, we call that moment the larval settlement, is that, uh, you know, I'm here and I will stay. And they stay by letting the coral colony grow around them and uh, dissolving the coral structure using special substances, such special enzymes that dissolve calcium carbonate. And it, they keep growing. And they get to a moment, and the, the coral colony keeps growing out. You can see here is moving up, and it gets to a moment when it will reach the, the maximum size. So this is the biggest the muscle will get. In this case, it could be around an inch, an inch and a half. Uh, from that moment on, uh, it, it is necessary for the mollusk, for the, the muscle, to suck water in for feeding. They filter feed seawater for small particles. And they also need the water for their breathing. So uh, at that moment, they begin making, uh, building little, uh, it's almost like little steps that help prop them up to keep up with the coral growth. And you can see those here in the actual, the photo of the actual coral colony. Uh, they keep moving up, moving up and leaving those little steps behind. And at some point, uh, uh, the mollusk dies, the coral colony goes on growing. But what I want to say is that imagine how if you had to live uh, entombed for life in the same little space without being able to move about uh, just, just doing your basic uh, chores day after day, that's what mahogany date mussels do. And there is our fellow um, Edgar um, Allan Poe again. There are many, many species of um, clams and bivalves that do that. That's a uh, folad, a, a form of pidoc from um, the coast of California, just south of Los Angeles, Palo, Palos Verdes. Um, and uh, someone um, open, I think uh, Dr. Doug Ernesty from uh, LA uh, had taken a piece of, um, of the rock to show his students a living um, 
a PDOC. And they basically do the same thing. They, they're capable of using their shell. In this case, they actually use the shell to grind into the rock and, and using some kind of chemical um, substances. They, uh, they, they, live, they live on, they keep you know, barring and burrowing inside the rock. There are some mollusks that do that for life, also inside driftwood. This is a little piece of driftwood from uh, Sunnibel, actually from Bowman's Beach. And it shows a very large number of pidoc, pid, um, striated pidocs um, inside that little, um, that little uh, twig or, or branch of, of driftwood. This I uh, estimate this to be a couple of inches long. So those are not too large. Um, those bivalves are super interesting that they, uh, they can grow to, to be about an inch, an inch and a half long. But if they're too crowded inside a piece of wood into which they bore into, they, uh, they stop growing and they become sexually mature. They can reproduce at a very small size. How do they know that? Um, that's a, a very good question, but they can do that. Uh, that's again the same, and I want to show you a side, uh, uh, actually a view of one of those uh, uh, clam shells, the pidoc shell, showing little uh, structures that they have onto which they attach their muscles. And the, what the muscles do, the muscles help move the shell back and forth. And that associated with the structure of the shell here. The shell is like pretty much like a very uh, thick, very coarse. Um, file and that will file into into the the wood so they also um, live live their existences their whole entire lives and tomed in uh, this uh, you know lifelong grave that uh, they had no choice but to uh, to live in and they're protected that way and that's uh, showing the inside of that uh, one of the valves of that species of clam um, I think this is my last uh, my last uh, example here, and uh, I can I couldn't leave a a program about uh, that involves Halloween without showing you um, a black cat. You know that's the first thing that I think when I think of Halloween, and I brought that in because the, the species we're going to talk about now is a very famous spe species of cone snail, and guess what? It's the is the cat cone. Conus catus, and Conus catus is not here just because it, you know, it's the Halloween animal um, relation there. It is here because Conus catus, the cat cone, is one of the few uh, that I, I call the elite group of cone snails that feed on fish. Most cone snails feed on um, worms. Um, and a, a few, a few of them feed on mollusks, and a very few number, uh, probably around 20 species, if I'm, I'm uh, not wrong, they feed on on fish. And imagine a corn snail is a snail. No matter how smart and fast they are, they're still snails. So you know, can compare the speed of a snail to the, to the speed of, of a fish that 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 the snail is trying to eat. So. Um, to be able to do that, corn, uh, corn snails have a very sophisticated uh, way of catching their prey. They catch their prey using um, a combination of toxins that do different things to the fish once the, they inject those toxins into the fish. Um, first and foremost, they use a very special kind of radula or, or radula tooth that looks like a harpoon, like an old whaler harpoon. And that harpoon is, is hollow. And the harpoon is connected to uh, a duct that connects to a venom gland inside the animal. Uh, notice here how, uh, first of all, the end here is pretty much like the barb on a, on a hook, or a, the barb on a harpoon. Once it goes in, it's very hard to come off. And uh, that's crucial for the delivery of that those toxins to the fish they're trying to eat. Notice also that um, there is a, the base here is wider. It's almost like a little ball. Um, and I'll explain now how that works. It's actually only recently, about two years ago, there was a paper uh, 
where um, a, couple, a group of scientists from um, um, LA, from the from Occident, Occidental College, led by Joe Schultz, they did a, a work. I'm actually reading here a little of the details because I, you know, I, I wouldn't remember everything. But one thing I, I did remember was that um, they fire that harpoon, that um, that little tooth. Um, at a speed that's comparable to the speed of a high power rifle being fired. Um, so the entire strike, when it happens, happens in less than 100 microseconds. And a microsecond is one millionth of a second. So it's pretty fast. Um, and then uh, now I will I'll try to show you a, a diagram from, uh, from Dr. Scholz and colleagues uh, paper. Uh, in which he explains how this works. Remember, there's a bulb here at the base of the tooth, then the duct is connected. This is the proboscis, it's a very narrow proboscis, uh, which is the elongate mouth of um, a snail. Uh, what happens is there is a, um, like a, uh, what's the word they use? Let's see, it's a latch actually, a latch like an inside hard O-ring that holds that, that, holds that uh, base uh, under pressure. A uh, pressure uh, builds here and the pressure builds and builds. And when the pressure is larger than uh, the tooth can be held here by that latch, then the tooth, the tooth is uh, propelled pretty much like the bu a bullet coming out of a high power rifle, delivering the venom through the prey skin. So this is my, uh, my last species uh, for the Halloween uh, quote unquote party here. And uh, I don't know, um, oh, actually, uh, yeah, I do have actually a video, I'm forgetting, I have a video of that. And I wanna just give, give a little heads up that um, the video lasts for like around uh, a minute. Um, I don't know, depending on your connection, your home connection, um, you may uh, there might be little glitches watching the video if if your uh, if your machine or your connection doesn't allow you to watch the video we'll be back we'll be back to normal in less than a minute you'll still be able to hear my voice i believe so let's look at the video the video shows a cat cone delivering venom to a blenny fish uh, and you will see how fast that happens and i'll try to explain as we go here uh, i'm gonna and I hope you can all see my, my image. Here is the proboscis, very narrow little tube, uh, probing for a good spot between the scales of the fish. Um, and if you look carefully, there'll be a moment when the fish convulses, it's hit. And uh, there you go, it was hit and it will stop because all those toxins working in tandem, different ones, they, they paralyze the fish, they prevent the muscles from moving, they stop the nerve system from working. Um, and you can see now the big mouth opening and uh, ingesting uh, the, poor little, the poor little guy. Uh, this is what corn snails do. I'm sure some of you have seen those uh, videos. Uh, YouTube is loaded with them. Um, and uh, here we go. Uh, it's not happy, um, and I hope you don't dream about that at night tonight. Uh, I hope I won't, uh, but that's, that's nature. That's the way uh, corn snails feed. And uh, just to uh, show the, the bri a bright side to that, and uh, whoops, I mean the wrong, no wrong screen here, whoa. Um, so the bright side of that is that uh, I'm assuming you can all see the video of a cat cone striking a goby screen. Um, the bright side is that cone snails have already provided a number of, um, of substances that are useful to humans. Um, there is a, a very powerful uh, pain medication that was uh, designed after following the model of a, uh, one of the cone toxins pre-out, um, it it's, works like morphine, but it doesn't uh, create habituation and, uh, and the horrible side effects of morphine. 
and so on. So you find a lot of information about that um, and on the web nowadays. So I want to thank you for your patience uh, and, and uh, for watching my show. And uh, Mr. Cat says goodbye. And I know you have questions of me. And I'll let uh, Mr. Um, Ankerson uh, drive yeah. through that stage. What a video. What a, what a way to go. <laughs> it's horrible. Yeah. Thank you. Great images, as always. There are several questions from the audience. I had a quick one before we get to it. The, um, you also have great photographs and everything. The, the ones at the beginning of the, of the, the radula and everything, almost like an x-ray kind of photograph. What was, yeah. was that an uh, x-ray? What kind of I photograph? Can, go, can I go back and, and, uh, sure. and still show that? So let me, uh, okay, you can, can you see it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's pick one of them. This is a very good one. This is an image done under a scanning electron microscope. And scanning electron microscopes, they, um, they do not use light to create images. They use electron beams. And it's kind of complicated, but electron beams have a very a much, I mean, hugely smaller um, wavelength than light. And it allows you to see details that light photography doesn't let you see, and uh, and it's a uh, it's a you no know, it becomes it's becoming cheaper and cheaper to have a microscope like that. They allow you to take pictures of small shells, small structures. I actually worked um, as a graduate student. I had uh, actually ended up having a full time job as a as kind of electro electro microscope technician for a while in the early nineties, and it's a cool machine to work with. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't have colors. You know, all you see is dark or or uh, bright. Um, some people actually can color that artificially, but I, I think it's kind of cheating. But that's what they are. Uh, another what, one what here. Think? You can see the soft tissues and all. Uh, yeah. So thank you. They look. They look terrific. There. Are, so there are uh, many questions actually from the audience. So let's get to those. Anna asked. What are the radula teeth made of? Yes, uh, great question. I should have. I should have. You know, there are always the questions of it. Oh, I should have thought of that. Should have. Anyway, radula teeth are made of a substance called um, chitin, and that's C H I T I N, and it's a uh, a protein. It's a long chain protein. It's pretty much like our fingernails or hair. It's um, so it's it can be hard. Uh, and uh, in uh, and it's uh, the teeth. Uh, let me see. Let me look again at that one. Those teeth are uh, replaceable uh, as they get used, especially in the drillers that drill through hard calcium carbonate. Um, that protein is hard, and it uh, as the teeth gets um, worn, it, it 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 is replaced by a new row, and and so on. So the whole life of the mollusk. There'll be new teeth coming on, coming on. I wish I could do that myself. Uh, hey, Brian has a question. What do vampire squid eat and how long is their typical lifespan? Um, I don't know about the lifespan. I, we could look into that. Uh, usually cephalopods have very short lifespans compared to vertebrates and you know humans. And um, I don't know. I know what they eat. They feed on uh, the stuff that, um, falls onto the bottom from uh, it's a, a, a vampire squids are, are deep sea um, um, cephalopods and there's a lot of accumulation on the bottom of the deep sea bottom of things that fall from the upper layers of, of, of the water column as we call so all this stuff is dying and there's a you know kind of a slush at the bottom and they feed on that that's called the detritus uh, organic stuff dead bodies and but all kind of in a kind of in a soup consistency that's what they feed on how long do the lettered olives live after feasting is there any connection to timing of finding them on the beach well um i think they may live around usually it's you know the shallow water gastropods of that size live anywhere between i don't know say three and five years maybe we don't know we don't have a study I never we never looked into that um, 
and I don't know that uh, there, there's probably uh, what we call in, in, uh, in fisheries biology, we call the ear class for the different animals. That means you may go somewhere and you may, you may find a number of um, olives, all of the same size living. And, and they probably all have a similar age. So that means that a whole cohort, that whole group of individuals were born more or less at the same time. Hmm. And then in the same spot, you may have uh, another a smaller size, many, many of another smaller size. There's no in between. So uh, you may have many of small, no medium, many of large. And, and in that case, you can, you can, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but there might be a, a way of telling that uh, um, if, uh, but we have to keep in mind also is that uh, us finding shells here on the beach has many, many things that influence that. The main thing being, you know, strong winds and currents and all that. Uh, when, if you think about only the empty shells. Thank you. Vicky has a question. What would happen if you ate a fish that had a freshwater clam attached previously? I don't think there'll be any much of a problem. Um, well, first of all, uh, usually when we eat things, we then you know, we cook them. So when in the process of cooking, you're you destroying all the any any toxin or anything that could be there. Um, not all of them, but most of them. Uh, the little little clams, the little larvae, they attach themselves uh, up to a point, but they're still very small when they fall off. So, uh, and they leave no uh, damage, you know, uh, from a disease standpoint. They don't leave anything behind, I believe, to the host fish. So it'll be okay eating them. All right, next question. What's the most vicious mollusk fight to the death you've witnessed and what mollusk is quote king of the ocean Ooh, that's uh those are tough questions um ooh. well i think some of this the corn snails you know for, i'm just answering in, in a different um sequence here your questions i think it's you know those kinds of um it's kind of personal, it's more subjective, but I'll say that a large fish eating cone snail like the ge geography cone will, will be, to, in my, my uh, choice would be like the queen and the queen, because they have separate sexes in this case. Um, they will be uh, kind of the royalty of the ocean. And uh, your other question, what was the most, most What's the most battle? vicious? What's the most vicious mollusk fight you've ever witnessed? Um, well, you know, we do see them here in the museum uh, almost every day when you see uh, moon snails or shark's eyes, as we call them here on Sanibel, uh, feeding on clams. Uh, you know, they put up a, uh, a lot of effort into uh, subduing that. They can drill holes onto, you know, the, the other mollusk and through that hole they inject uh, venom to paralyze them. So there's a lot going on. Uh, I, I don't know if there's one, uh, one uh, feeding moment that, um, that was the, the most one, but usually, um, you know, I'm, I'm very impressed by moon, moon snails and shark's eyes and all those, those kind of rounded, uh, round uh, animals we have. We have them live here in the tank. You yeah, I, know, I know our living Junonia like to eat lettered olives. How do they, how do, yes. they do that? Well, that's that's probably that's a good reminder, Sam. I mean, we actually have that. Uh, Rebecca Mensch made a video and we published a little paper on it, in which uh, Junonia hits a uh, a ladder olive, and which apparently is the excuse me preferred uh, food for Junonia. And we believe that they inject something into that um, olive so that they subdues the olive. The olive it becomes lethargic. And, and easier to, uh, to feed. So that's probably the one. I mean, that's, uh, that, that was pretty vicious. Mm -hmm. And it's on record. Right. Vicky has another question. If you are a blood, snuck, blood sucking snail, do you eat anything else? Uh, now that's excellent. Good question. No, usually not. Um, if you take, for instance, the, 
the little guys, the pyrams that feed on, um, you can see this here, right? You can yeah. see my screen? Yes. Um, those guys, as I, I was mentioning before, they have, um, they feed by the end of their proboscis tube, which is like a flash tube with, with an opening at the end. That opening is pretty much like a hypodermic uh, needle, uh, not a, really a hypodermic needle. It's, it's pretty much like a, a nice pick that pierces the surface of the skin of the, the oyster. Um, and, and, and they can only do that. They cannot, you know, they cannot use to do anything else. They cannot do that to drill onto shells. They cannot do, they cannot graze on it. They are, you know, pretty much uh, your microscopic vampires, if you will, um, you know, pure blood, uh, blood sucking snails. Hmm. Okay, it's like a couple more. Angie has a question. How quickly are the harpoons on cone shells reloaded or are they retracted and reused? Oh, excellent question too. Hi, Angie. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, what happens there is that uh, the, uh, the harpoons are just rattler teeth. And you remember in the beginning, I told you, uh, not the beginning, but uh, just recently I was telling you that as the teeth are get worn, they are replaced by the rows that come and you know, they're being formed inside the animal. The same thing with the harpoons, they are, they are rattled teeth. So once one is used, no, it's not retracted back into the cone snail. Uh, it's, it probably is ingested, it, it, they eat it with the fish, um, probably eliminated later somehow. But, uh, and then there'll be another one just ready coming out. And, uh, and, and I can use it again. I have to remember those, um, those meals of a cone snail eating a large fish will last for days and days. Uh, you know, the digestion and all that, it does, it's not like us eating popcorn. I mean, those things, they go in and the, the snail has to bury in the sand or hide to digest that fish. And, uh, and uh, in, in the meantime, the new, the new teeth are being deployed and put it into position, getting ready for the eventual um, next dinner. Yeah. Horrible. Well, that leads into our last question from uh, Jolie. Hope I pronounced that correctly. Can cone snails kill a human? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's a long story, but um, that, that's, you know, that's a great question, too. Uh, I should have. Uh, I'm taking notes here. <laughs> things to say next time um yeah since i was a kid i mean i i you know i uh, uh my dad had a collection of national geographic and uh, one of the things that impressed me you know in an old article about um, shells and mollusks was the fact that some species in that at that time um, mostly focused on the great barrier reef in australia that they they could uh kill people because of the the intensity of uh you know, of their, their toxins. Uh, there was a case of a guy that actually put, uh, picked up a, call, a live call, uh, geography call and put it inside his shorts to, uh, and, and kept snorkeling and finding more living shells. So it was pretty soon he was hit. And by the time he was, you know, getting CPR on the beach, he was already going. Oh my gosh. So um, yeah, they, uh, the, the toxins of cone snails are not just one. They are some of the worst toxins in uh, venoms, actually, in the in the animal kingdom, and they are not just one. Any given species of cone snail has what we call a cocktail of um, of toxins, and each each toxin does something different. One acts on the muscle, uh, the other one acts on nerve transmission, the other one makes the animal sleep right away, and and uh, and so on. So uh, you're not hit by just one by uh, by just one uh, one substance. You're hit by a, and a whole a whole battery of them. So it's pretty bad. Wow. The local corn snails, uh, especially the large one that we have here, for those of you who are in uh, Southwest Florida, or like to come here. The alphabet corn is a worm-eating, uh, possibly also mollusk-eating 
um, a snail and uh, the sting of such a species of, of the local alphabet cones is pretty much like the sting of a bad, big, bad wasp or a hornet. Uh, it's not gonna kill you. It you know, causes some uh, pain and some swelling and some temperature, but it will go away in less than 24 hours. So uh, I'm not recommending you get stung, but if you get stung, um, you know, don't worry about it by and large, I guess. Well, thank you very much. There are a lot of comments in the chat about a uh, great presentation, great, le great lecture, and it was. Thank you for your time. And thank you, audience, everyone, for joining. Happy, was it Radula Ween, Jose? Radula Ween? Happy Radu Raduween? Is that what? Radula Ween. Radula Ween. Happy Radula Ween. Happy Halloween. And until next time, uh, so long from the Bailey Matthews Shell Museum. Thanks so much for joining us. Good evening. Thank you.